Hello, everybody. Anna Sabramowitz here. I have a very special uh, guest and friend and colleague with me today. His name is Kevin Thorne. And um, we're just going to dive into some awesome topics today. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to read his bio. And I do suggest you Google Kevin Thorne to see the real Kevin. But anyways, Kevin is an award-winning e-learning designer and developer, consultant and owner of Nuggethead Studios, uh, which is a boutique custom design and development studio specializing in online learning experiences. Now, okay, this is really cool. After retiring from the U.S. Army, Kevin pursued a career in corporate IT and training and development. With his combined military and industry experience, Kevin started the studios in 2012, working with clients in various industries solving problems in a wide range of creative projects. Now, he's based in the North Mississippi Delta, and he harnesses a bench of creative practitioners in instructional design, e-learning development, illustration and graphic design, animation, and serious comics, which is my favorite topic, uh, to design creative and innovative solutions. Kevin is a well-known industry speaker and trainer on e-learning development, design workflows, and is a certified facilitator in Lego serious play methodologies. Uh, Kevin holds a, um, sorry, a BS in information technology management from Christian Brothers University and an MS in instructional design and technology from the University of Memphis. And he can be found on Twitter as Learn Nuggets, at Learn Nuggets, and obviously on LinkedIn, um, or around learning uh, communities, uh, teaching and facilitating workshops where he writes articles, reviews, and shares tutorials. And uh, because he's so active um, and has actually had great success with running workshops, those are some of the things that I'm going to pick his brain about because um, I know that a lot of the people that watch my YouTube channel are great at uh, building skill sets uh, and they have a lot of skills, but they, they have um, difficulty getting themselves out there or actually even sharing their ideas with their department to bring about change. So this is a great person to have to talk to about that. So thank you and welcome Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> That's a mouthful. I have to shorten that bio. I'm hired. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, kind of kind of cool transition there um army to this it learning what like why did you why did you go that way and then also um like what what inspires you to continue because you've been doing this a while yeah so why did i join the army was that the first question no why did well yeah you know what tell me why <laughs> did you join the army did you get kicked out of the house <laughs> in so many words <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was one of those 19-year-old kids that had uh, uh, a lot of enthusiasm, but not a lot of discipline or direction, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, I knew I wanted to go to college, and I tried the college thing. I actually went to college. Um, the first attempt was a um, Tron, the, the movie and the game. Yeah. Um, I was inspired to be a computer game programmer. So that was my first attempt at college. And then there was math involved, and then that got kind of too much for me. Um, and then I decided I would go and be a graphic designer and went to school with that. And I was <clears throat> um, prompted to submit a portfolio to Disney, which I did, got thoroughly rejected, and I just got depressed. So <laughs> I, I knew that if I wanted to do something, I needed college, but I was, you know, it was that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then you know, just hanging around with the wrong crowd back then. And um, Justice of the Peace gave me an option, his uniform or Uncle Sam's the next time I saw him. So I said, I'll show you. I'll just volunteer. And that way you can't make me join the army. <laughs> oh, man, this streak, I think it continues. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, so yeah, but it had, you know, had the, the, the GI Bill and the college funds. I think, well, I'll just go in and get the college fund and go back to school. Well, it turns out I was having a good time in the military and I was good at it. So I stuck around for a career. Um, but then when I got out, I didn't, there was that time. And I, I don't know if you call it midlife crisis or whatever is more of a Holy cow, that career is over. I'm not prepared for the next phase of my life. Mm. So I didn't, I really took the military time for granted. I didn't go to school. I, I was just really into being a soldier. Yeah. 
And uh, when I got out, it was kind of that shell shock, culture shock kind of thing. Um, and um, and I was, it was kind of more of an anger period. And I don't know if we're getting into this part of this conversation, but it was kind of an anger period where here I am coming out of the military. I was, you know, supervising a large number of people, I was, you know, lives and, you know, missions and response for, you know, multi-million dollars worth of equipment. And then I come out and I have to deal with people in sort of this hourly wage mentality. And it really angered me that <clears throat> why do people think that way? I mean, this is your job. You know, you can't advance in your job unless you do the job you're doing now really well. And if you don't do your job really well right now, what makes you think you're going to be prepared to do the next job? And it really, and I was like, this is, doesn't make sense to me. So, I, I mean, I struggled for about a year. Um, then finally, <clears throat> you know, dare I say, pulled up my bootstraps and um, stopped feeling sorry for myself. And it was right around, actually, it was right around... Um, Turn of, the, turn of the century, uh, 99, 98, 99, around there. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, you remember, you remember Y2K and that big scare? Oh and, man, geez. I remember my whole workplace shutting down. We were just, yeah. cause we were all online, right? So. Right. So I was, it was kind of interesting. I was in retail at the time. Um, and I remember from the, the information technology side of retail, they were just freaking out. They were worried the store was going to like implode on itself, you know, on New Year's Eve. Yeah. And it just kind of got my attention. And not to mention it, and I may get this wrong, but the programmers who were responsible for that date code were COBOL programmers. And I may have gotten that wrong, but there wasn't that many COBOL programmers available. So they were demanding some pretty high salaries because they were the only ones capable of fixing the problem. Mm -hmm. And then that was one of those, aha. And that reminded me of a piece of wisdom my father told me one time. Uh, figure, what, figure out what people want and need. Figure out if you're good at it. And then go make a living doing that. Those are the wisest damn words ever. And right? So I got, to think, I got to thinking, well, I'm not good at that because I don't know anything about it, but I could definitely see, you know, and then you got the whole dot-com era and technology, you know, I said, you know, there might be something to this. So that's why I went and got my IT degree, figuring I'll just go on an IT career, fix stuff, hmm. and, you know, I should be able to, to manage the rest of my life fixing something. Um, that <clears throat> led me to... Um, the corporate office, that's how I ended up here in Memphis, um, as a help desk supervisor in the IT department, which, you know, at, at the surface, it's just sort of a managerial supervisor job, but you're managing technicians. So I had exposure to not only that particular technology, but I had exposure to how all of the data systems and all the technology, the infrastructure of a company works, hmm. from databases to telecommunications to mainframes all of those things and how they all work together and how they have to work together and what happens when something breaks. So it was just, you know, another two or three years in the, in that area. Um, and then turns out one of my good friends happened to be the training manager and we would go to lunch every once in a while. And then finally he says one day, Hey, I got a, a spot open for you if you're interested. And I said, yeah, what's that? He says, a oh, training analyst. And the word analyst scares me because I don't like spreadsheets and, it's, you know, I just, I'm not an analyst. I can't, I don't do data. I don't do numbers, that kind of thing. Now, if you hear the printer going off, somebody in the house is printing. <laughs> it just went off over here. I heard some little. <laughs> yeah, that's the printer going off. Um, so anyway, um, so he said, no, he says, you know, you got your military background. You've got IT experience background. I know you're a creative because, you know, illustration and stuff like that and drawing graphics. Um, he said, I know you're a really creative person, but I have this idea. We uh -huh. have, we have all of our training is three ring binders. So people read a book mm -hmm. and then they go to a mainframe terminal and they take a multiple choice quiz. He says, I want to convert these manuals to a website and I want to be able to know who reads which book. And if they read the book or not, and then I want to be able to uh, 
track the results right inside that website. So what he was saying, as we know today, is he was talking about the vision of what an LMS is. Yeah. Um, and I was fascinated by the, the, by the vision. I said, well, that's pretty cool. He said, well, if you come on board, we'll, you got to get you in at this position, this title, and then we'll, we'll work it. But you don't have any direct reports. You work directly for me. I'll give you complete autonomy. I'll give you a budget to go travel to these conferences and figure out what we, what we need to do to build this place up. Nice. I'm game. Entrepreneur. I got, nothing, I, got, stakeholder. <laughs> I got nothing better to do. <laughs> That's true. So that's where it started. That was about 2003. Uh, over the next four or five years, you know, went through that path and helped them implement their first LMS and um, uh, learned all about e-learning and developing and, you know, started with Lectora, then Captivate, and then finally Storyline. Uh, and I don't know, it's just another 10 years or so. And then right around 2010, I guess it was because the iPhone came out in 20, 2007 um, and then the iPad came out in 2010 and all of a sudden all these companies were chasing the shiny object, the new tablet. Right. Yeah. And everybody wanted to do all these good things. QR codes were, you know, big hot thing then. And, I have uh, a friend who's still like QR codes are going to come back. It's a, it's the next thing. And I'm like, okay, you've been saying that for like seven years now. I'm waiting for a QR. No. You know, she's got something there. <laughs> I'll let her have it. <laughs> this is the Merge Cube, and it is a AR cube, and these are essentially QR codes. And you code these cubes, and you show your phone onto this cube. Yes. And then AR, something comes out of this cube. Oh, very cool. I think they and do that with tattoos now, too. They do, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, small story short, um, finish that up, and then um, I don't know if you remember the – the mission turf grass course I did back in 2010. Yes, it was. Okay. Kevin, that was awesome. That was the one that I took to demo fest in 2010. My mm -hmm. first demo fest won that. Yeah. Uh, and back then it was a cash award and I took that cash and went and bought an iPad, my first iPad. That's cool. And, um, and it just, everything kind of went from there. And then two years later, I was like, you know, <clears throat> this is painful watching corporate go through these committees, trying to decide what to do and when to do it. Yeah. Um, so I just needed to exhaust my own curiosity and I started freelancing just to figure out what's out there. And that freelancing turned into a full-time job. And then one of them had to go. Yeah. And here we are seven years later. Fantastic. You know, what's funny, I mean, it sounds like your job already had kind of the education was baked in, but the idea of decision making is, um, for me, the stall is frustrating. And so I now pick clients that are a little faster on that decision making cycle. It's courageous, super important to me because like when, you know, we'd be like, Hey, start a project 18 months from now, we're planning to do something. And I was like, I can't like, there's no way you can maintain momentum. Like it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also the other thing is the idea of um, having supreme autonomy to learn. Like if something engages you, like you now can just, you're like, hey, Lego's putting on this thing. I'm going to go because it's like, I love that. I think that, mm -hmm. that just. Well, there's, I think attitude. Um, there's another phrase I heard the other day, uh, the gratitude of attitude. I think it's the attitude of gratitude or something. Yeah, like. yeah. Um, I've been in some pretty tough spots in my employment career, just like everybody goes through peaks and valleys um, to the point where you're just, you don't even, it's, it's all you can do to get up, get, put your shoes on to go to this place, whether it's the place, whether it's the people you work with, the people you work for, um, you know, whatever it is, there's always that period and you have to push through it. Um, but it's being grateful for what you have at the moment, not for what you don't have. Mm -hmm. And then it's your attitude on how you do that. Cause my attitude was um, I can go home at night and spend two to three hours learning something new to, to build my skills or I can watch TV yeah. and that's a choice. And some people like I'm so exhausted. I, I, I can't think about anything after work and I get that. I've been there. Um, I mean, I went a year working the full-time job of a place I didn't want to be 
to come home to work a full-time job in order to get to a place where I can quit the other full-time job. Yeah. And it takes a lot of not, I don't know. There's, you can do it if you want, but it's, it's not easy. And it's, and the other thing about, you know, that I, I learned the hard way as well is um, there are people who, who need permission, let's say from their boss or whatever, to actually learn new skills. Or when people say, Oh, I, I, I would love to try this out, but my boss won't buy it for me. And I'm like, dude, you can go home, do a free trial plan, plan that stuff. You can learn it. There's, there's so many options. But the other thing is that, you know, a lot of people, um, don't want to be, um, an entrepreneur, let's say, because they have to learn now how to be, how to run a business. Right? Yeah, it's not for everybody. No, no, no it's right? not. this is hard work. <laughs> no, it's, and it is hard work. And, and I, I subcontract, I got a bench of people that I work with and a lot of them are just simple freelancers. They're the practitioners. Yeah. And, and, and they would, they, they're much more comfortable not being, not client facing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, it's, they don't, they're not, com it's not that they're comfortable. They just, they don't feel the, I don't even say it's a feel. It's like, like you just said, it's, it's just not for everybody. Yeah. So if I said, I, I would love to do this work as long as I don't have to talk to anybody. That, that's kind of the thing, right? Yes, totally. Yeah. And then, and that's fine. Those people have a place like they're, they're zoned in on their work and uh, you know, they like uh, the idea that you can't, some people, um, not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Some people want to be a part of a team because teams yeah. can accomplish bigger things, right? You, right. Other right. than you could on your own. So yeah, totally yeah. get that. Although, like you said, um, getting in front of people, some people hate that. Like for me, that's like my favorite part of the job is just yeah. no. skills, marketing. That's my thing. I love it. So. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's like, oh, I'd love to work at home and, you know, be my own boss and you know, <laughs> wear shorts and a t-shirt and that kind of thing, which I am. I'm in barefoot oh, shorts hat. and a t-shirt right now. I'm at home in my house. My hat. Yeah, my hat. And I could go downstairs and get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich anytime I want. Mm -hmm. But self-discipline in this environment is harder than it is at any other corporate going to a cubicle farm because you have to you have to know when to work and when not to work. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And, and not be distracted because you know, you can get distracted easy at home, laundry dishes, you know, I want to take, Oh, you know, I can, I'm gonna go watch a movie. Dog. Sure. Dog. Yeah. You, I mean, you have all those choices, but the discipline comes to, um, you know, having a good plan and a good schedule and knowing what tasks you have to accomplish one day over the other. Now the schedule, how you do it. Now my schedule is, I might not go to work till 10 o'clock in the morning one day, but I also know I'll work till 10 o'clock that night. Yeah. Or I might take a Thursday off because something's going on that I can only do on a Thursday, but that means I'll probably work Saturday. Yeah. But I have that control and that's probably the upside of being independent. Mm -hmm. um, but you still put in, I'm, you still put in more hours than anybody does. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to be a pro you have to I mean I think people don't understand that like they think there's some sort of like a freedom that it's actually like it's all on you the more effort you put in the better the output so you just I feel like you almost get a little bit addicted to that yeah well it's yeah it's that right I think addiction is probably <laughs> that's probably a good word it's kind of what you thrive thrive at you wake up and you're like what am I going to do today <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's your baby like it yeah. is do you think the military had an impact on your uh, entrepreneurial sp spirit? Like, did it influence? I don't think the entrepreneurial side. I think when I hit that training department and I started right in the smack middle of that, you know, LMS and e-learning, and I was able to bring my creative side to it. Um, and in that department, there was, there was a, a level of training, uh, facilitated, you know, face-to-face -face training that we did as well. And, uh, and it didn't dawn on me until that moment that, I was being groomed to be a trainer because that's all we did in the military. I mean, you, you wrote 90 day training schedules and then you would submit those and they get approved. And then you followed that. I mean, every hour of the day was, was tracked on what you were doing. And it was, it was some type of training somewhere, whether it was physical training, mental training, tasks, whatever you were doing, mission training. And it always, and then when I got into corporate, I was thinking, why don't, 
why don't corporate follow more of the military st strategy more because it's so effective and they, they, dare I say, they get stuff done. You know I mean? <laughs> dare say. <laughs> and <laughs> one of the other things that, that it, it dawned on me is in the military, uh, mission first, failure is not an option. So whatever you decide the goal is or the objective is, this is the objective. Here's the team. Here's what we're going to do. You know, just like we do in corporate, right? Mm -hmm. But there is no excuse, zero excuse to fail. Mm -hmm. We will meet that deadline. We will accomplish this objective, you know, adapt, improvise, overcome, you know, the whole thing, right? Then I get into the, the, the civilian world and we'll accomplish the mission only if everybody's feeling okay and we got enough money to finish and if something else doesn't come up in the middle of it to, you know, take priority. So they, that whole fair is not an option is not a priority. Mm -hmm. And I, it took me a while to accept that. I wasn't going to change that. Yeah. But it took me a while to accept that and then learn how to be, how do I, how can I still maintain efficiency, but be flexible enough to flex with that sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. And that took a while. That's not easy to do easy. That's not, you know, it takes a while to figure that out. Yeah. From a military, I'm saying for me, coming from a military. Yes. Mindset. Yes. And, and it's, it's, um, I think that you still have to maintain it as an entrepreneur because there, it, you can't always start, you can't start every project with concession. And I feel like that's what happens is if you're, if you're planning to fail, yeah. if you're planning, it'll go over, which I know stuff does, but just don't, like, well, it, yeah, it's like this. So you, you, you plan out a planning, uh, a project plan and you put a schedule together yeah. and you have milestones and you have critical milestones. And then the milestone is dependent on if everybody does their job. Yes. So if I'm doing a, a body of work and then I send it to you and I need your feedback or review by this day in order to maintain this project schedule, but it takes you an extra week to get what I need from you back, that then impacts the schedule. However, well, we still need it on the same time. Well, that's not what we agreed to. We agreed that any delay on either of our part would impact the schedule. You see what I mean? See where that goes? And that, that yeah. discipline, you, you can't change that because it's like, well, we're going we're gonna to kick it out another two weeks because you know you didn't do what you but it goes back to that the priority of missions mission essential and fair is not an object there was probably something critically important on your end that took priority over what project we're working on yeah and, us and usually does and that's that's the state of business that's how business works mm -hmm. and going in as an entrepreneur as an independent you have to understand that Mm -hmm. that a lot of times the project that they hired you to do, you're not priority. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And, you'd be, and you got to be able to flex and, and adjust. And it took me a long time. Like I said, coming from that discipline mindset, it just took me a long time to let go of that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then mitigate and manage those expectations otherwise. And there's a balance. Like, I mean, it's not like one is right, one's wrong, but no. there is a, you know, you're kind of always flowing and knowing when to push. And, and the, I mean, when you're, especially when you're an outsider, really coming in to provide a service, you realize your, your sphere of influence is smaller. And like you said, I mean, you know, every day I work with people who are experts, right. And they're, they're working with me to design some sort of a learning uh, scenario, but that's not their job and everything else that comes up, it's their awesomeness that's over right. there. That's right. I'm just, you know, I'm, That's right. I'm, on side, I'm on the sidelines. So yeah, I get that. I get and it. then on the flip side, you get, I get, I get, I get a kick out of clients that um, they think I sit in a cubicle down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And then they just like, yeah, they just walk up and it's like, Hey, well, I need this. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> or, you know, call me at six o'clock at night or, you know, different things like that. I say, well, wait, hold on. <laughs> Have you, uh, have you heard of that? Um, you probably have that uh, article, the maker versus uh, manager schedule. Mm -mm. 
what it is is just the idea that um, maker versus someone write that down maker versus manager so um, a lot of her clients are managers right and they're like yeah. super flexible they'll take calls anytime meetings are flexible but from for makers uh, in any company uh, the idea that you have dedicated huge chunks of time to be completely undisturbed to be able to produce and focus is like like most organizations are manager blah right and they don't actually say that you know when somebody is developing something to put a meeting in the middle of that just like yeah. destroys three hours of productivity well that that draws me to um the book flow getting into the flow zone yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um because you have to think about that let's say you have three hour block of time to do something yeah where you have to focus right well, it, it take depending on who you are, it might take you 15, 20 minutes to ramp up to that flow. Yeah. And then you get into that flow. And then when you get disrupted by a call or an interruption or a meeting, then it takes you another 15, 20 minutes. So you're, you're losing almost a half hour to an hour's worth of time just in the up and down to get your brain back in that focus. And unfortunately, during the day, I want to say unfortunately, but um, as an independent managing projects, some projects I work on, I get my hands dirty on some projects, I'm managing two or three subcontractors. Yeah. Um, but then you got all of the, you know, self development, keeping up your own skills, you've got marketing, you got all these other things, the business admin side, all that stuff. And the day gets so busy with all that kind of stuff that my flow zone usually doesn't start until seven, eight o'clock at night. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, that's like, that's like second shift. <laughs> yes, that's true. And that's, I've actually found that too. Or uh, what I've done too is done the, the extreme um, 4 a.m. wake up. Nobody else is around. Yeah. And just, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. hard. It's really hard. I, I commend you with that 4 a.m. thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read uh, Jocko's book. Um, uh, Jocko, um, I forgot his last name. It's uh, called Extreme uh, Extreme Ownership. He's a he's an ex uh, Navy SEAL. Have you read the uh, the book by uh, You Can't Hurt Me Hurt Me by uh, Bill Goggins? No, no, you give me some great titles here to look at. Goggins. You can't hurt me. You can't hurt me. He's an ex now Navy SEAL as well. Jocko is also an ex Navy SEAL, and he's a he's a four thirty a.m. man. I think he has a club. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, it, some of the things that you say, like the idea of, um, you know, different kind of discipline, he's been able to kind of uh, bring that back into especially extreme ownership of, of, um, uh, of situations, bring that into the corporate world because they need it, right? It's kind mm -hmm. of, he brings that hardness, toughness and... Yeah, I'd like to read that because that, you, you hit on a key word there, ownership. Yeah. Um, own, own your reality. Mm -hmm. you know and what it results. is own it. yeah own the results own it you know you have to own it and if you don't like it then change it but you have to own it where it's at yeah exactly it's really it was it's a really cool book and everything i've ever read from him is i mean it's tough it's tough love but yeah that's it's just takes you to the next level as far as just it it, to, it brings the um it, it brings responsibility but it also brings control back to what you can do right so it's huge really I, well, and it, I think it all comes back down to choice and attitude. Um, uh -huh. it really does, you know, and you think about military, you know, I woke up at four, four thirty AM pretty much my entire adult life. <laughs> when I left the military, it's like, I don't have to do this anymore. Yeah. yeah. But I'm more of a night person. So um, I think you, I think you have to adjust to where you find your flow. So if your flow yeah. is, you know, um, if your flow is in the evening, if that works, that's it what is. you think, you know? So but here's, cool. here's the thing that I love. I, you know, I'm actually thinking about adopting Thomas Edison's style. Just work and take 20-minute naps 24 hours a day and just kind of work around the clock. That's crazy. I don't know. But then you'll yeah. never get into like that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually a huge sleep. Like, uh, I love my sleep. I love sleep. I love mornings. I love midnights. You know, it's yeah. it's a... Mm. Yeah, I don't know if you could ever get into deep sleep with 20 minute naps. No, it's a creative curse. Yeah, right. I think he was a, he wasn't human. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. 
So this, this is what I want to get into too, because I, uh, you, I've obviously I've, I'm a big fan of your work and the things that you do, uh, and especially this visual uh, component of mm -hmm. work. You've been a big inspiration. So, okay, you were talking about you know uh, your your peers recognizing you for the fact you have this um, illustration, visual design. How did you? What happened? Where? Why did you get good at this? Practice. Come on, that's an easy answer. I don't like it. No, it's it is <laughs> because <clears throat> I've been drawing since I could hold a pencil. So it's just it's just it was just a natural ability. It's a natural talent. Um, I was never really formally trained other than high school art classes and that little bit of graphic design college that I took. Yeah. Um, but just that general interest in just like anything that you're really, really passionate or interested about, whether it's painting, knitting, you know, cooking, whatever, those people who are doing it without the promise of, of reward or payment, it's out of the, the, just the true enjoyment of, because it's what they enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And they're they get really good at it because they practice. Yes. And they get really, really good at it because they challenge themselves if you think about, you know, recipes, you know, they challenge the science of ingredients and how different ingredients re interact with each other and react towards each other. And the more knowledge you get around your subject, the more of an expert you can be about that subject. Mm -hmm. So me drawing my whole life, it never really got, I think the first time I got paid was a retirement caricature gig. Somebody paid me $50 for and I was ecstatic that somebody actually thought that my drawing had some kind of value to it, that somebody else would, would pay their hard earned money for something that I did. Mm -hmm. um, but I still, you know, the whole starving artist thing, right? That whole, um, <laughs> it's still, there's still this, this, because it, it's viewed as so effortless, effortlessly to draw is like, Oh, that's really cool. And it's like, Hey, well, can you draw me this thing? And I want it color and I want it like this. And then you give them a price. Like, Oh my gosh, that's, yeah, that's more than I expected. I said, yeah, but you don't understand that's four hours of my time to produce that artifact. Yeah. So if you do an hourly rate at that and you just do it, I'm actually giving you a discount. <laughs> yeah. So, but <laughs> so it's, it's difficult a lot of times, you know, to put value on art. Um, but then I had to think of, so it, when I was in corporate, I was looking for opportunities to bring some of that creative stuff in. Mm -hmm. Where can I find opportunities to, to put things in? <clears throat> and I remember one particular, yeah, you know, my first published um, cartoon was, um, it was the company internal newsletter on health and wellness. And they were doing a article on asthma in children. And they, this was back in clip art days, you know, in clip art libraries, you know, where you paid a subscription to have access to a big clip art library. Yes. And they could not find, they wanted an asthma boy. <laughs> Good luck with that. It's called Bean, <laughs> bean Character. <laughs> so they were looking for a childlike. Asthma boy. <laughs> yeah, asthma boy. They were looking for a childlike character <laughs> using an inhaler. Oh, God, like that's really Rescue special. inhaler. Yeah. I said, well, can you draw one? I said, sure. <laughs> so I did. I drew the little character. And it got published in the little newsletter. And then, you know, and they said, you know, art by or character by. And there, so then here, all these people from, you know, around the building was like, oh that's, oh, that's pretty good. So that became sort of that awareness that, oh, that Kevin guy can draw. And it just kind of went from there, different things. And then people would come up and ask them. My boss would get mad and say, well, wait a minute, that's not part of your job. That's somebody else's job. So then, then it started getting to the point where, if somebody wanted to use my talents or my skills outside of training department, yeah. they had to get permission from my director. Oh so man. You, you have to go ask my director permission to borrow me for some other project that takes me away from my, my day job kind of work, Yeah, yeah. which <clears throat> you know, it was kind of funny, but I, I appreciated it because I wasn't getting pulled in a bunch of different directions. Yes. Um, but then I've always had this, you know, love of comics and love of instructional comics or comics for learning, as do you and Ryan. 
And I've done the reading and the research back on when that all started and when it was used and how it's being used even today. Yeah. As in why doesn't corporate use this medium more often? It, mm -hmm. There's gobs of research that supports it. Yes. And from, there's, right. And, but, but also like not just long history of proven track record, like mm -hmm. of big institutions. Successful. Yeah. Well, that, and my, my, one of my biggest heroes, Will Eisner, who did the uh, Military Preventative Monthly magazine on mm -hmm. training. It was, and I remember in the military, and it just sort of that come full circle, I remember being in a soldier getting that little comic book every month and loving it. And I had all the issues until my mom sold them in a rummage sale one year when I was not at home. That's okay. I'm, I'm over it. Have you um, forgiven her yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but those were instructional comics the military was using and it ran for, they're still running today. So what 50 some odd years success run. If that's not proof enough that comics for learning or using the medium of comics to, um, to send the message of instruction of some kind, then I don't understand why. Well, I do understand financially why it's because it's, it's more, it costs more to do these kind of projects than it does, you know, a typical e-learning or, or other kind of project. Um, so anyway, when that when I had the um, opportunity to start using that medium as I could and just kind of slide it in without permission and then just kind of get my own sort of empirical research, if you will, just from basic feedbacks like, oh, yeah, that's good, but yeah, but that's good. But and then I'm thinking, well, if I had more time to, to really model the characters or if I had more time and we had a bigger budget, we can get some really good voice actors to really act these characters out. So there's all these components that would come together. Um, and then as technology increased, you start seeing things like motion comics and interactive comics and serious comics for different things. And I think, okay, now that technology's met up with my interest in comics, now how do I mash technology with these? Yeah. And <clears throat> so now when projects come up, not every project, it just depends on, on the project. Um, and if I feel that the comic medium might be a potential solution to, to, to get this message out, then I'll pitch it as a comic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if I don't, if it doesn't sense it like that or whatever, I won't even bring up the topic because I'm, it's, it's not about forcing every, it's not for everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, tell me why do you think, okay. Other than cost, because cost is okay. For, for <laughs> illustrators, I got to say cost is coming down because you just have tons of people doing that now. Right. Mm -hmm. So if cost is not an issue, which for some organizations, I know how much they blow on just mm -hmm. stuff that isn't even good. So what's the problem with uh, corporate? Why is, why is there such a You need more time. You need, you, you need, you need exponentially more time to design it properly because as, as you know, you have to write a good story. Okay. So how do you write a story around instruction? So when you do instructional design, now you got to write instructional design, but you got to, you got to kind of wrap a story around that instructional design. Yes. So do you write the story first and then do the instructional design or you do the instructional design first and then wrap a story around it? So that's always the challenge. My, you do the ID first is, is you knew the answer to that, right? You do the ID first, but then when you start writing the story, that ID might get flexed. It might have to yes. move around a little bit, right? Yes, exactly. <clears throat> Once you get the story done, now you've got, through that process, you've identified your characters. Yeah. And what are your characters? What are their roles? What are their backstories? And we do an extensive backstory character modeling simply because we have to have the sense of um, everybody involved, all the stakeholders, including the artist, needs to have a sense of what that character's personality is. What's their motivations? What's their fears? What, what drives them? Why are they the antagonist? What causes them to be that way? What's their attitude about being the protagonist and why are that way? So we, we kind of design this extensive character modeling sort of background story and we character model them and everything. So then we get a sense, we start, we start personalizing them. And as they start going into these roles and we, then we can start seeing whether, oh, that doesn't fit there, this fits. So it just takes, it takes more time. Um, now, when you go back to the illustrator, um, yeah, you can, you can, you can hire a, a really, really talented illustrator. That's yeah. not the hard part. Yeah. It's, it's actually not, it's as far as I'm concerned, when you have somebody who is good at what they do, that's the easiest part. That is the easy part. The hard part 
is finding an artist who understands sequential narrative. Yes, yes. <clears throat> okay, because tell, us, tell us the difference. Like what, because uh, I think that maybe people f see, like you'll go on like a, a site like Behance, right? And you'll see people's individual little bits, but that doesn't make a good, um, a good comic book or, or narrative artist, like you said. What's the, what's the difference there? Well, th they understand the narrative. So when you give them a script, they can. They have to be able to visually and, and um, understanding comics by um, Scott McLeod yeah. has um, has a good understanding of that timing and pacing, like the gutters in a panel. Um, why is why is one panel, if you will, all horizontal across the whole page, and then four individual panels below that one? Yeah. And it's simple because you want to slow time down on that first panel. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then time goes fast. So sequential narrative is how, do, and that's one thing about the layout and the framework, but then how do you draw or visualize that scene in order to depict that pacing or that time or that action or that camera angle? And that's the other thing, the sense of emotion. So somebody that understands sequential er narrative can do sort of a um, high angle shot looking over the shoulder of a character. Mm -hmm versus um, maybe a shot from the desk looking up at them this way. Uh, and it's not just straight on, you know, face characters and profiles of facing each other like a cartoon strip. So an illustrator, so that's where a comic artist, somebody that's in comics, comic books, that kind of thing, comic artist has a better understanding of sequential narrative. They may not have the artistic skill as somebody you might find as a children's book illustrator or some really, really professional cover art, album cover type illustrator. Mm -hmm. So you have to weigh the options. Do you want to put your art director hat on because you like this particular artist style that you found on Behance? Now, you have to put your art director's hat on and you have to direct that artist into, here's how I need your art put together for me in this project for, for this output. Mm -hmm. I don't just need static drawings. I need, I need drawings and layers and I need, um, you know, the background and then all the artifacts and then the character needs to be on separate layers and things like that. So a comic book artist understands that because they know when they go back in and edit, they might have to change the colors or flex the texture or move some things around. So the way they set up their, their Photoshop or illustrator file, they do it. That's just what they do. Yeah. So when I come in, I say, Hey, you know what? We've got to, we've got to add a wristwatch to this one character on the left hand because it plays a key role in the next scene. And that watch becomes one of the main characters or something. So we, we need to, we need to present that wristwatch earlier to kind of set it up. Kind of thing. So it's easy for them to go right back in there and fix that. Mm -hmm. And then an illustrator who just says, Oh my gosh, I have to redraw the whole drawing. Yes. Right. So that's the big, so you have to, you have to weigh the difference or you mm -hmm. might, your client might pick a style say, well, I want this style, I want this artist. Okay. That's great. Then you have to, um, well, I'm, as a project manager, you have to kind of go in and say, okay, what kind of experience does this person have in this type of project? Yeah. And how much, consulting and um, you know I put my art director hat and work one-on-one -on -one with this person yeah in order to be efficient so they're efficient doing the work and they so we're not going back them back and forth whereas a comic artist I can find a comic artist I mean I pick up the phone and pick a dozen of them real quick and I think understanding sequential narratives sequencing and things like that I think that has more value in this type of than the actual style I agree with you. The style is subjective. Totally. And, and it's actually, I find that <clears throat> that, that realm is so, so outside of the scope of most instructional designers and even like trainers. It's, it's such a, uh, a skill set with so many pieces that <coughs> once you find those people, they, uh, the illustrators that I've worked with have, brought so much to a project and there's so much more than you know than the little like the surface level stuff that you see in their portfolio there's so much so many layers to making that good and 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 what i love is you know having like yeah i've done the upfront work of like the instructional design and the, and the scripting 
And then I hand that off and that person's able to just like come back with something that's more than the sum of the parts that I provided. Right. It's just yeah. so cool. It's such a cool collaboration. I really, I don't think people get how cool it is when you're like, I've worked with, even with like graphic designers, I'd be like, listen, I drew a circle and, and this, and I'm like, listen, do you know, can you just do something with this? They'll come back and I'll be like, I look like a genius. <laughs> right. It was my idea. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> but I feel like that's, it's, it's interesting that you make this distinction. And I, I actually think it's very important is that one person could like, you know, make me an infographic or whatever if I had the right structure and data, but uh, somebody who understands story and yeah. that narrative and adds their own experience. Yeah, and that's, and that's where I think that's why corporate doesn't use this as often. I get about right now I'm, I'm tracking about one big one per year. I mean, that's how frequent they are. Mm -hmm. And they take, you know, four to six months. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's, <clears throat> and that's a long time to do one project, you know, yeah. Yeah. the, the biz, pace of business and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but the two things that take the most time is the artwork and the scripting, writing yeah. a good, writing a good script. So that kind of leads into my next question because I thought, okay, uh, I'm an instructional designer at a uh, big corp poor baby C. And now I'm reaching out to Kevin and what are some things that I need to know to actually be able to engage in a project that involves illustration? Like what should I do to prepare? Well, well that's a great question. Um, and I got about four answers that come flying in right, right <laughs> one time. <laughs> uh, well, it, just like any new project, you know, what's what's the needs now what's the goal what's the objective what are we trying to accomplish and just like we ask that same question all the time is e-learning the answer maybe yes maybe no could this be done with a job aid mm -hmm. an infographic yes. could we do it with a short video so when we think of comic think comic is just a medium no no different than you would choose video as a medium yeah. or you would choose an infographic as as the final output yes so when you when you when you come with a project to me and they say, well, we think this would be a good interactive comic. Then I can say, okay, let's look at your story. Well, we don't have a story. Well, we have to start there because we're not just going to, and I know I rub some feathers when I say this, but uh, an interactive comic for e-learning is not just adding characters to a static slide. Yeah, that's not a comic. You can do comic panels and you can put comic characters in there, but it's not, you know what I mean? Yes. But it, it, there's so much more effort on the back end to really make a good story because one, the characters have to relate to the audience. So you need some good analysis that you need to spend time with the audience. You need to spend time with what, you know, gets their goat, so to speak. You need, you need to, what motivates them, just like all of the other analysis we do with typical e-learning. But how do we, we go through that analysis, but how much of that data, how much of that information we actually bring back into the project? Mm -hmm. Very little. Yeah, that's totally Very true. Very little. But with a comic, you can bring every bit of that into the comic. You can bring their entire world inside this comic story. Yeah. You can get them to really, and what's fun is, um, the one we're working on right now, one of the characters is actually modeled after one of the stakeholders. I love that. So they when, love that too. Yeah, they love it. Oh, they absolutely love it. But not only that, the, the audience knows the character, knows the person, so they can relate to that person in real life because that character is appearing in this sort of comic. That's and really this, cool. And the story is written, you know, in their culture. Yeah. Um, it's written in their languages. All the little nuances about their environment are displayed visually. Um, so there's so much more you can do visually and relate to that audience. And that is the key. We want to engage them, right? How do we engage them? Get them excited about seeing themselves or relate to that material. Just like we do video, right? When you put when you put, you grab employees from around the company and you, and you, they become actors in little training videos, they get excited to participate. And then when all of every, when, when their peers see them in the video, oh, hey, I saw you in that video. That was great. So there's that post training connection between peers 
And with a comic, there's so much more you can do with it too, because you can take that artwork and you can create infographic posters from that artwork. Yes. You can create printed job aids with that same artwork. So there's so much more the other mediums that you can use that same project with and, and, and spread out you know, over time. It's, it's kind of, it's weird to me because I, I talk to people every day who, who ask me questions like, well, how do I make a story that's general enough so everybody could relate to it? And I'm just like, that is not a story. That's not, <laughs> I'm not laughing. People I'm, like laugh. I'm laughing. <laughs> you see details. It's funny because you're like, detail is awesome, right? Like little yeah. personality quirks and things. Well, are... it starts, it starts with a big theme, right? You got to have a theme. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, what's your theme and how are you going to do it? Is it a superhero theme? Is it a journey? Is it, is it, you know, anamorphic characters? You know, who are the characters? It's, there's so much brainstorming. I mean, we spent two days in a, in a room with a whiteboard brainstorming the story before we even started writing the story. Yes. Yes. That's very and, fun. Yeah, and that's where you that's where all these ideas get pulled out. And when that happens, new ideas emerge. It's like, oh well, maybe this is a better idea. And then you explore that idea for a little bit and then it hits a dead end. You say, okay, well, let's go back to this idea. And you have to go through that process. Yeah. Because if you start and it goes back to design before develop, because if you start production before you finish designing, you're gonna you're gonna have a, a big wadded mess on the floor. <laughs> it's not gonna well, work. Uh, so uh, really uh, like it sounds like, and I think it, this is it was getting there, is that stories are really the underpinning of everything. Um, yeah. And I feel like it's stories are the underpinning of learning because soldiers sounded like learning machines to me from what you described. And the fact that you looked forward to this story that came your way that taught you something. I'm, I'm really pleased with that. I think that's a great. Well, I mean, approach. think of it this way. It's not the only Maybe. approach, but. But maybe maybe it's maybe it's too simple to think of it this way. But when you go and you have a really good experience shopping, or you go to a movie um, that you were on the edge of seeing because of reviews, but then once you went, you had whatever your experience is. You tend to share that experience with people. You tend to share, hey, you know what? The first time I was in that store, it was great. You ought to check it out. Or you see some event happening while you're out. Oh my gosh, did you see that car, you know, swerve off the road and almost, you know, hit that pole? Those are, those are stories. And every time we're impacted or we're, we're attracted to a story, we tend to share that story. So now take that. That's our life. That's the way we live. Yes. Now take, take that attitude. How can you write a story for learning that when the audience, the learner gets done with this story, they go tell their peers? Mm -hmm. Did you take that safety training story? Oh my gosh, it's the best story I've ever taken. That's what, that's your goal. That's what you're trying to, will that ever happen? I don't know, but <laughs> that's the goal, happened right? happened twice to me. Yeah, it's happened a couple of times. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure it has. But, it's, it, yeah, and it's, it's kind of funny because we've, we've, we've separated that. Um, I feel like we've, we've sterilized in some ways the training that we deliver from that story integration so but also i think a lot of people are are intimidated by story well here's right. here's my advice to those folks if this is something you're exploring something you want to do but like you would mention earlier about um you know certain supervisors or certain cultures and companies will intimidate it or they're not they're not ready to for whatever number of reasons i would recommend a proof of concept i would recommend finding a small topic a very small short topic within your organization that you can practice writing a story and doing something with it, whether it's the comic medium or not, but just, just sign, find some little proof of concept and did, and just sell the idea of, I want to try this and I want to see, and then, you know, approach it from the whole research approach where I want to give it to a control group and a regular group with the same training yeah, and get some feedback. Mm -hmm. And see what kind of feedback we get or, and then measure some kind of result after that. It doesn't have to be a big e-learning project, big training project, mm -hmm. just something you can knock out in a couple months, you know, given, you know, other projects and time that you can work on it. The whirlwind. Uh, but, yeah, but you're not going to know until you don't know what you don't know. Yes, yes. So as far as learning how to, you know, craft a story, what's your, what's, where would you point people if you had a, oh, gosh. 
would you just say watch a boatload of great movies and (laughs) you know there is there's no there's a lot there's a enormous amount of information on story um stories about film um stories about nonfiction, stories about animation yeah um there are so many approaches and structures so it, it's not so much we're, we're writing stories for training yes which i don't know if there's any genre out there when you go look for how to write a story or writing you know disciplines on writing structures or story structures mm-hmm. um there's nothing out there about how to write for training write a story for training at least i haven't found anything I know one, Aesop's Fables. <laughs> <laughs> they were teaching stuff. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, Don't look that up, everybody. It's just pretty. <laughs> but I would, I would recommend understanding the fundamentals of training. I wrote an article for Learning Solutions Magazine last year about um, roles and themes and characters and structure. And it's just sort of that fundamental where to start, where to look. Um, I haven't seen this article. I will, I will find it and put it under the video. Um, Sorry. And um, so, you know, for instance, if you're a big fan of superheroes, right, if you're into the superhero comic sort of approach, so think of the story. You've got a, you've got a superhero and a villain. You've got a protagonist and an antagonist. So there's your two main characters. And then there's usually another character that's sort of the supporting character for the superhero like the wizard or the, the wise or the caretaker or the, um, you know, James Bond's Q, you know, works on all his gadgets for him. So there's, those are your characters. Now those characters have to be people. You know, characters can be any object for that matter. Yeah. Um, and then what, what is the protagonist trying to do and why is the antagonist trying to stop him? Mm-hmm. So just, you just got to go way up high, right? So when you think in the world, let me give you an example. The, the project we're working on now, it's, um, it's, it's a simulation for nurses on how to give birth, right? So how to go through the labor and delivery. So there's a nursing uh, supervisor or a, a super facilitator who facilitates this simulation, and the students are nursing supervisors. And then after this simulation, these nursing supervisors then go back to their clinics to teach, train the trainer and teach it and take it down to the, um, the nurse level. Yeah. Well, the, the training problem or the gap is the transfer of knowledge from this simulation back to the clinics is not happening. Mm-hmm. In terms of the time and effort and money and the cost of putting these simulations together, um, they're not seeing the results at the clinic level as, as they had thought. Yeah. So how, are, how can we transfer the knowledge? How do we get these nursing supervisors to, to really get this stuff in them? And that's where the comic. So why don't we do it as a comic, but then have a, a printed job aid version they can take with them back to their clinic so they can hand out smaller versions of the training they just went through in this comic format. It's like, okay, that's, that's the plan. Now, the characters are a super facilitator, who is a nurse, and then the professor, who is also a nurse. And their backstory is they were nursing students together. And then after graduation, they went different ways to different clinics. The one, sup- the one nurse had a really great experience with her facilitators and learning everything. And she just got so passionate about being able to care for these mothers and she's made it her mission in life to ensure that all simulations run as smooth as the way she was taught Mm -hmm. so that everybody can be a super facilitator like her. On the other hand, her friend who went the other direction had a really bad experience. She was yelled at, she was condescend, she was criticized. um, She was never felt safe, you know, in that learning environment. And she just got this huge sort of anger and depression chip on her shoulder and that she's now going to ruin every simulation she can find. She's going to come in and disrupt it. And how she does that, in her lab, she's harvested um, some bugs, like some insects and some bugs. 
And then what she does is she goes to these simulations and she lets them out of their jar and they fly around this room. Well, the bugs are other characters and these bugs are self-doubt, worry, um, unappreciative. So it's all of these bugs that we feel when we're in an environment we're not feeling right. Mm -hmm. So we get self-doubt and worry or arrogance, different things like that. Well, when these bugs appear, then the energy spray, when the super facilitator sees the bugs, she whips out her energy spray. <laughs> this is so cool. And sprays the room to get rid of the bugs. Then the bugs die, and then the antagonist, the, the professor, is like, foiled again. And then they go into, you know, sort of this post-learning and say, okay, what did we learn? Like, well, I was, I was feeling, you know, doubtful. Or I was feeling worried. But this is how I overcame that and this and that. So there's the lesson and the learning. And it's interactive and there's some choices involved. And, you know, and the bugs fly around the screen and, you know, do stuff like that. So. so, but you're really, what you're doing is you're bringing to, um, bringing to life emotion. Because it's, it's, I think there's a lot of times that training focuses so much on the, the, the executables. You got all that right, right? But then there's all this other stuff. That yeah, but, well, the soft skills. Yeah, right? that just gets in you know, the way, like you said. Um, how do you, how do you have confidence when you have doubt? Yeah, exactly. You like, know, how do you how do you train that? How do yeah. you teach that? Well, you put it in a scenario and you put it in characters. So the so so your e learning in this in this you're not being spoken to. You're a third person watching. Uh, you're watching somebody else go through what you can relate to. Yes. Oh, I can relate to that character. I just went through that. Mm -hmm. But then you watch that character overcome that and what they've done and the resources and tools and the people that help them overcome that to be better at what they do in their job. And then you're like, ah, I didn't know that. Now I can go get the help I need to do the same kind of thing. Yeah. That's the goal. I mean, that's what we're trying to accomplish. Yes. Oh, yeah, totally. And it, it's, uh, it's cool. I, I read that um, basically what you're trying to do while looking at that other person is you gain the satisfaction, right? That validation, right. Validation and satisfaction of achieving that before you even achieve it. You're like, ah, oh, that's cool. I love, I love that integration with the story. That's yeah, and the validation of I'm not the only one going through this. Hell yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Like it's not, I'm not alone and yep. I didn't make this up. This is, <laughs> this is something that other people experience. So you talked about um, confidence. Now you run... I mean, I don't know if maybe it's different for you because you were in the, in the military and you kind of, you already facilitated it, you trained, but um, now you're getting up, let's say in front of audiences, you run a workshop. How do you, how do you build confidence to do that? Sell your ideas to people who don't believe in your ideas or have no clue what you're talking about or don't like, <laughs> right. They're like, uh, yeah, okay, Kevin, uh, that's, that's great. You're bringing up this fancy book, but I, you know, I, I'm in the camp, I think, or I, this is where I'm comfortable, <laughs> is I remember what it's like when I didn't know anything, when I sat in that cubicle farm and I was given this responsibility to do these things in my second career with no college education thinking, how I don't know what I'm doing. I, how do I do this? And I remember the people that helped me um, the different tools or skills or resources or, you know, or just that little side, you know, boost of confidence conversation. And I think I get my satisfaction out of um, all the people getting started in this industry or just exploring some of the new ideas or getting started with some of the new software. I know what it's like to start there. I mean, I just, it's, you've got, you're just so overwhelmed with, with all of the, expected skills and demands that you're expected to have in the role today, unlike when I first started. But now if you go look at job descriptions for anybody in our industry, that's, you know, a typical position, like what we do, you've, you've got to have, I mean, they'd be paying you $250 an hour for as many yeah. skills as, as they're asking you to have at a, at a proficient level. Yes. And we all know that you can't be proficient at all those skills at one time just it's impossible yeah so when folks are interested i'm i want to give them sort of that fundamental baseline here's an 
option or here are some other skills and let me show you how you get started. And it's about uh, what I love about teaching storyline is um, not all the fancy, you know, things you can do with storyline so much as it is workflow and efficiency. Yeah. Because if, if you're in the same position that I was, where I've got 17 projects laying on my cubicle farm desk, <laughs> and one of them happens to be developing this e-learning, and I don't have a whole lot of time, to get, I gotta have it done by like in three weeks from now, I don't have a lot of time. So I, I love the idea of these aha, I was just there last week doing it, and I was showing some, some little techniques, and it's like, oh my gosh, you just saved me like an hour's worth of time. Yeah. Because it's, it's not so much about what the tool can do, it's how does that tool fit in the workflow of a project? Yes. Where does it fit? And then there's, there's, there's phases of how you approach a project and there's phases how you approach building one of your interactions and when do you prototype and when do you not? So it's, it's about efficiency. So if I can shave three seconds off of a, off of a process within Storyline and I have to do that process 25 times, and then I have to do another process. I can shave a few seconds there. At the end of the project or the end of the week, I've shaved an hour off of my time. Yeah. That and adds that, up. That adds up. It adds up fast. Yeah. And what can I do with that hour? So it, it just, it's about efficiency. So, and that's what I love about teaching workshops and stuff. It's just, it's the different ideas that I come up with. Like, for instance, the drawing one or the visual literacy. Uh, I did that one last year at DevLearn. And again, I've, I had this... Uh, true program true coder programmer was a was was a developer first and now getting into design which is usually the opposite way yes and they're they're very analytical very structured very logic thinking right this yes. a b c you know if then else kind of that sort of process thinking and when we put all the computers away and we did the whole the whole day was analog i mean you're just drawing on paper the whole day and at lunch she came up to me and she's like oh my gosh she goes this has totally opened my world. I can, I can see where I can solve problems so much faster on paper because I've always wanted to open my laptop and start solving the problem, you know, in whatever tool. Yes. And teaching folks how to put the laptop, put the tools away and just go down a pencil and paper and, and just think through your design. There's so many more aha moments you're going to have, which will then save you time because you can think through where you need to go, your next steps and stuff. And it has nothing to do with drawing or skill in drawing. It just has to do with visualizing and, and learning different techniques and how to visualize what you're thinking. I love that approach. I think that, that we should have almost like shut down, shut down Tuesdays or something where <laughs> really are just everything. I love it. <laughs> this is gone, right? And uh, you're absolutely right. And, and the, the times where I've had the discipline to do that, is where I've come up with some of my best work because it's the there's the infiniteness of the software is sometimes a uh, curse, right? Well, it's noisy, it's yeah. distracting, and it's not, and because you're sitting in front of your laptop, there's other distractions. Yeah, and it comes back down to discipline because your your brain gets in, you get into that flow, but then your brain runs into one of those little traps. Yeah, and you and you stop thinking about that design. Well, let me take a break. I'll go and check over here. I'll go check Twitter. And then that leads you to a link and then that leads you somewhere else and you go read an article. Yeah. So then you're, you're distracted. You're not in that flow. You're not in that zone. So when I, every project I start is always on paper That's and, cool. I, and I step away from this desk to do it. Yeah. 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 You know? I've seen, and I've seen some of your really awesome um, videos of how you work on projects um, on LinkedIn. I, I really like that you shared that. That was, was great. Yeah. I'm getting ready to start another one. I just don't know what day yet. That's I'm awesome. So um, I think yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. So, okay. I, I do have to ask you this now. If you, do you ever get like, you know, you present at learning solutions, you run workshops. Do you ever get like, uh, uh, afraid to go up on stage? Do you ever go like, Oh shit. No. What helped you? No. No. What helped you? What, what, <sighs> this guy, the, 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 the philosophy behind nugget head, we are all nugget heads. We all make mistakes. We're all human. So get over yourself, right? The folks are coming to see you because you've got something interesting to say. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. So just be yourself. Say what's on your mind and get over it. I mean, that's, 
because the whole nugget head idea is like we, we just I get I get sometimes I get so frustrated at the drama around um, you know this stuff it's like look we make mistakes just get over let's get the work done what's the job let's get the work done focus okay. and get it done so the yeah so the I, I don't know I just and if you can't make fun of yourself then you know, who do you make fun of so it's it's like you're uh, I love this uh, basically you're saying it's your ideas that speak for themselves do your best to get that out there and yeah, and, and thank you for, for coming back to that because if you're confident in your idea and if you're confident in the message that you, you've, you've taken the time to think through this idea, you've taken the time to write up a description to submit it to some conference proposal process, the reviewer, the event organizer who reviewed your idea thought it was good enough to be on the program and accepted it, that right there should give you the, the boost you need because somebody's listening. Mm -hmm. or somebody is paying attention to me and I like, you know, that's, that's the grateful, you know, gratitude of attitude kind of thing. And then it's like, okay, now, now sell it to your network, your, your social network is like, Hey, I'm going to be here. I got this idea. I'm going to talk about if you're interested, come by and say hi. Yeah. Right. And then when the room fills up or not, you know how many were in my first, first session, my very first conference and it was on visual language. How many people? Seven. Oh. And it was one of those <laughs> but and it, and it was it was one of those shotgun rooms, you know, it was really long, narrow, like three yeah. chairs on both sides and then really long. And most of them were in the middle or the back. Nobody <laughs> oh, no, took the front row. Hey everybody. <laughs> it's it's funny because I think everybody compares themselves to the final product. And, but then you don't see all the damn work that went into getting there, right? And mm -hmm. just clarifying that. Well, and the other thing, and, and, and I can't remember, I'm, this is sports do it a lot of times too, but um, when you talk about the end goal, think of yourself, visualize yourself in that moment in front of people presenting your idea. Mm -hmm. Kind of visualize yourself through that talking, asking questions, you know, replying to answer, you know, you answering questions um, and just practice, you know, going through your presentation practice and just kind of visualize yourself there and everything's fine. You're going to stumble. You're going to stumble over your words. You're going to turn around and you're going to look at the screen and you're going to talk to the screen by mistake. We do it. I mean, that's, we're not, I mean, we're, we're not all that pro, we're not pro presenters. <laughs> I think it's like you said, it's, it is practice. So, um, from your career and it's been varied and awesome. What do you think was, if you could choose one lesson, uh, that was most impactful for you that has really changed the way you do things in this one, I've had three careers so far, <laughs> which one, <laughs> which, um, so, whichever one you feel has really had the most I, impact on you. The one that always resonates with me, um, and it goes back to my military days and I was a young sergeant and there were two others who in that same unit that were peers of mine, equal sort of rank. Um, and, um, my platoon sergeant at the time was probably the first time that I really chose involuntarily chose him as my mentor. Uh, but then it turned out he was my mentor, but um, I was given a task. Now, kind of set the stage here. Um, every um, quarter or so, uh, units have to go qualify with their weapons. So you mm -hmm. go out to the range and you shoot a number of rounds at targets and then you have to qualify that you can actually hit the target. Yeah. Um, and then um, the responsibility of which unit and then, and then another unit comes out and does the shooting while another unit is responsible for setting up the range, um, getting all the ammunition, manage, managing the range for that week or two weeks, however long it takes to get everybody through it. Yeah. Well, it was our unit's turn to manage the range. So um, my platoon sergeant came to me and he says, hey, uh, you know, our ta we're tasked to run the range coming up. I said, right. He says, I need you to go 
and go sign for the range and get the, um, it's called a range flag. It, it's, a, it's a big giant red silk flag that you hang on a pole outside the drive going into the range to let anybody going by that is hot, that okay. there's live ammunition, you know. So you have to, once you get that red flag, you essentially own the range. It's your range now. And I was tasked to go sign for the range and get the flag that one day. I said, okay, I'll go out there and get it. So I went out there to get it and I was quickly stopped at the range office. He says, do you have your, your range qualification card? Meaning, are you qualified to be somebody to supervise this range? Yeah. And I was like, I don't know anything about that. He says, well, you have to go to a class and a training class. And then you come back out to the range and we'll walk you through all the things that you need to know in order to get the flag. Okay. When is the class? It's like, well, it's this Saturday from eight to five. Okay. Sign me up. I'll be here. So I did went back and um, went back to the report. He says, well, how to go? I said, well, I didn't get it cause I'm not qualified to get. So I had to go to this training class. I signed up. It's a Saturday. He said, yeah, but that's Saturday. I said, well, it's the only day they had and we need the flag. So I'm going to, I signed up and that's where I'm going to, that's where I'm going to be Saturday. He said, okay, good to go. Thank you. It wasn't until I was about, this was months later, if not a year later, I was getting ready to leave, deploy out. Um, and uh, he brought it to my attention. Do you remember that day when you went and got the range? I said, yeah. He says, do you know, I tasked that with the other two, your peers, I tasked them both with the same task that day. Yeah. And I said, really? He said, yeah. And he says, you're the only one that took the initiative to sign yourself up for the class because the other two came back and said they couldn't do it. They had to sign up for the class, but they didn't sign up for the class. They just said, I can't because I don't have this class. I see. And what taught me that taught me that, you're going to run into obstacles. You're going to run into jams. You're going to run into managers that don't agree with you. You're going to run into all kinds of obstacles. What are you going to do in that moment? Are you going to say, Oh, I'm done. They said no. So not saying that you'll get past every obstacle, but look for opportunities to get, what are, what are some other opportunities to get past that? what are some other creative ways to, 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 to negotiate this situation? So if anything, I think that's probably the one big thing that I always remember that no matter what's in front of you, there's, there's always the other side. Mm -hmm. Might take you a while to get to the other side, but just keep pushing, keep fighting. You'll get there. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good one. That's a fantastic story as well. It's it. all about the story. It is about the story. And I'm glad you gave us the context. That was really solid. And you know, what's cool is like that, that whole mentorship idea. I, I seriously love it. I don't think, I, I think that's one of the things you really have to seek out when you're doing this stuff just to find mentors. But the fact that you didn't get told that until like months later. And that also taught me of what a really, really solid leader is. Here's, here's somebody that knew what he was doing deliberately and he almost all, already knew what the outcome was, but he needed to kind of test his theory. I'm going to send these three people out to do this one task and I already kind of know what's going to happen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he never told the other two. Wow. He never, he never told the other two. And to this day, I don't know if they, if they understand that lesson or not. Yeah. But that was, that was an impactful lesson for me. On so many levels, that's such a yeah. great yeah. experience. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. So thank you for sticking around. I really appreciate it. No, and this is fun. I enjoy chatting. <laughs> we haven't had been able to catch up in a long time. I know. I know. So, okay. So, um, and I've already sh uh, shared in your bio where people, you know, should get in touch with you, but can you just tell us one more time if somebody wants to get in touch, learn more about your work or just uh, engage with you for, uh, for a project, where should they go? Well, um, don't Google Kevin Thorne. <laughs> I'm sorry. I could, I should have got the action figure. He's over there on the show. <laughs> Uh, Google it. Actually, just Google it because it's pretty funny. I love it. Uh, but Learn Nuggets is um, is the Twitter handle. And then anything Nugget Head, you Google that, you can find my website. 
uh, just search my name on LinkedIn. Um, pretty much um, Twitter, LinkedIn. Oh, and then my Facebook page, and that's just Facebook Nugget Head. That's awesome. There. And look yeah. for that little symbol that you have on your hat. Like, do this. See that? You, you can find him, you find me. <laughs>